Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We'll give it a couple minutes to fill the room here. Afternoon again, everyone. We're going to give it another minute or so to fill the room here. Afternoon again, everyone. We're going to give it another 30 seconds or so to fill the room. You don't have the Jeopardy music on, Brett. We probably need it, don't we, Dr. Shapiro? Yes, we do. <laughs> we'll give it a couple more seconds here to fill the room. Great. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us once again for our weekly webinar, Wednesday webinar series. Today's webinar is on cellular therapies for hemophilia. My name is Brett Spitali, and I'm the Vice President of Advancement here at the National Hemophilia Foundation. At any point during the webinar, if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We have NHF staff members monitoring these questions, which we will pose to our presenter at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the community beginning on Friday, March 5th. I'd like to introduce our presenter today, Dr. Amy Shapiro, is the Medical Director at the Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center. Thank you for taking the time to join us today, Amy, and I will now turn it over to you, get us started. Thank you very much, Brett, and thank you very much, NHF, for inviting me and having me speak today on behalf of Sigalon Therapeutics and my co-investigators on cell-based therapies. I will present the SIG-001 platform and study, which is a novel encapsulated non-viral cell-based therapy for, th for hemophilia A. As Brett said, I am Dr. Amy Shapiro from the Indiana Hemophilia and Thrombosis Center in Indianapolis, Indiana. Next slide, Brett. These are my disclosures. Next slide, please. Hemophilia A arises from pathogenic variants in the factor VIII gene affecting approximately one in 5,000 males. Current treatment options include frequent IV factor concentrate replacement and newer subcutaneous non-factor or novel therapies. New modalities such as fusion recombinant proteins and gene therapy, as well as newer non-factor therapies are under investigation. Cell therapies with genetically modified human cells are a new potential therapeutic approach. Next slide, please. There remain significant limitations to existing therapies, such as non-ideal factor kinetics, morbidity from breakthrough bleeds, including chronic joint disease and impaired quality of life, inhibitor development, treatment burden, including lifelong frequent IV or subcutaneous administration, risk of thrombotic events, and coagulation test interference with newer non-factor therapies. A novel cell therapy platform with genetically modified human cells has the potential to alleviate most of the limitations shown here by delivering sustained factor levels with an ability to redose the cell-based therapy, as well as reducing patient burden with decreased use of health resources. As a potential therapy, cell therapy has two key obstacles to overcome, including avoidance of the host immune response and activation of a foreign body type response, resulting in pericapsular fibrotic overgrowth, also called PFO, which I will discuss in greater detail in the next slide. Next slide, please. Cell-based therapies have faced a challenge that is twofold as previously outlined. First, the implanted allogeneic 
or xenogeneic derived cells are quickly rejected by the host's immune system. And secondly, even when these cells are protected from the immune system by encapsulation in biomaterials, the biomaterials themselves activate a foreign body response. On the left is an example of rat islet cells that were delivered with and without encapsulating biomaterial into a mouse diabetes model. Here you can see with the dotted line that naked islet cells function to maintain normal glucose levels at first, but are quickly removed by the immune system. Even when the cells were encapsulated, as shown with the solid line, over time there was pericapsular fibrotic overgrowth, or PFO, formation that ultimately resulted in an increase in blood glucose with therapeutic failure. On the right is an example of PFO formation and immune cell adhesion onto the surface of a capsule made from alginate. This PFO results in a blockade that eventually cuts off the cells inside from nutrients and no longer allows therapeutic proteins to be secreted from inside the capsules. While the cells can be protected from physical interaction with the immune system by encapsulation, we must also protect the capsule material itself from the immune system. Next slide, please. To tackle the PFO challenge, the MIT research group led by doctors Bob Langer and Dan Anderson scanned thousands of small molecules that when conjugated to alginate would minimize PFO. This combinatorial approach generated a library of 774 analogs. Phenotypic screening identified a family of small molecules that prevented PFO in rodents and non-human primates. Next slide, please. The small molecule conjugated alginate spheres were further tested in long-term experiments in rodents and non-human primates, and they were found to provide protection until the end of the study, which was up to 12 months after intraperitoneal administration. The two pivotal publications in non-human primates are shown on the left. On the right, the graph is showing long-term protection of rat beta islet cells in the mouse diabetes model. Next slide, please. This critical discovery and in vivo proof of concept led to the development of the Shielded Living Therapeutics Platform by Sigalon Therapeutics. Their non-viral cell-based modular platform called SLTX for short, is designed to address challenges with encapsulated cell therapies. The cells are protected from physical interaction with the host via encapsulation within two compartment modified alginate spheres, and the novel proprietary small molecule prevents PFO and is covalently bound to alginates in the outer layer. Thus, this technology provides both an essential physical shield from cell-to-cell -cell interactions, as well as a mechanism to prevent PFO from forming on the surface of the spheres. Next slide, please. The selected cell line had important characteristics such as prior safety demonstrated in clinical trials, ability to divide and fill in when a neighbor cell dies, called contact inhibition, and macrophage-like properties to clean up dead and dying cell debris. These attributes allow a long-lived cell presence like a mini tissue or mini organ that is contained in the spheres. These cells will have a stably integrated transgene and can produce high levels of protein for long periods of time. The sphere components are also optimized for both prevention of the PFO and cell viability. This is why the two compartment sphere is key. The outer layer is optimized to enable the small molecule conjugate vitamin material to prevent the PFO buildup. 
The inner compartment utilizes a peptide conjugated to alginates to create an environment that allows the cells to survive and thrive. In addition, the last important element is standardization of manufacturing. The manufacturing process is both flexible and scalable. Next slide, please. The investigational product for hemophilia A, SIG001, uses the cell line and is genetically modified using a non-viral vector to express human B domain deleted factor VIII. Cells are encapsulated within the two compartment alginate spheres. Again, the outer layer contains the antifibrotic small molecule and the inner compartment contains alginates optimized for the viability and productivity of the cells. Next slide, please. SIG001 was tested in the mouse model for hemophilia A. The amount of human factor VIII produced was dose dependent, albeit not a one-to-one -one linear response, as you can see in the graph on the left. SIG001 corrected the bleeding phenotype, as you can see in the graph on the right. Bleeding time is significantly longer in mice treated with non-genetically modified cells compared to both wild type and hemophilia A mice treated with SIG001. Next slide, please. SIG001 was further studied in the preclinical setting to assess safety and durability. This immunosuppressed model is used to evaluate the long-term safety and human factor VIII production by SIG001. On the left, the preclinical studies in NSG mice showed no concerning signals in the safety or toxicology profile of SIG001. In the figure on the right, you can also see that sustained factor VIII levels were dose dependent, again, albeit not one-to-one -one linear. Next slide, please. SIG001 was additionally tested in non-human primates. As you can see in the figure on the left, the encapsulated human cells were alive and functional after 28 days in the healthy non-human primate. As non-human primates develop inhibitors to the human factor VIII, PK in non-human primates cannot be fully evaluated. On the right, empty spheres were administered to non-human primates to evaluate long-term safety at up to 12 months of follow-up. At the study completion, no PFO and no abdominal complications were observed. You can see your you can see clear spheres on the greater momentum in the image on the right. Next slide, please. SIG001 is designed to be administered using a short two-port laparoscopic procedure using standard equipment and technique. In the operating room, the sphere solution is carefully aspirated into a syringe catheter and the spheres are placed into the peritoneum into one port while the surgeon has direct visualization on the second port. The spheres are placed in the upper peritoneal cavity on top of the greater omentum. The protein produced by the spheres is absorbed by the lymphatics and thereby through these channels reaches the blood compartment. Next slide, please. We recently presented a poster at the American Society of Hematology describing the now active first in human phase one, two clinical trial of SIG001, an innovative shielded cell therapy platform for hemophilia A. Next slide, please. SIG001-121 is a first in human phase one, two open label dose ranging sequential dose escalation study with the primary endpoint of safety. Secondary endpoints include factor eight activity levels, both by one stage and chromogenic assay, annualized bleeding rate, annualized factor eight concentrate use and factor eight inhibitor levels. Exploratory endpoints include changes in health, quality of life, 
and physical activity questionnaires, number and frequency of bleeds and target joints, and hemophilia joint health score. The first Sentinel patient will be started on the lowest planned dose. A single dose of SIG001 will be administered into the peritoneal cavity using a short laparoscopic procedure. There is an option to expand any dose cohort with up to three more patients if needed. The next dose level will follow the same pattern followed by the highest dose level should safety findings allow it. Patients will be followed for five years after the administration of SIG001. Next slide, please. The study population will include adult males with severe or moderately severe hemophilia A. The eligible patients will also have had 150 or more exposure days to factor eight products and normal levels of unwillibrand factor antigen. Key exclusion criteria include patients with current factor VIII inhibitors or a history of factor VIII inhibitors or ITI and patients medically unable to undergo a laparoscopic procedure. The study will be conducted across three countries, UK, US, and Germany. The clinicaltrials.gov study number and UDRA CT numbers are shown on the slide along with the contact information for the sponsor. The study is currently active with two active sites in the UK and one active site in the US. Next slide, please. CTA filing in the UK and IND filing with the FDA were completed earlier in 2020. SIG001 has gained orphan drug designation both in the EU as well as in the US. The first in human clinical trial with SIG001 in hemophilia A was opened in the second half of 2020 with open clinical sites in the UK and the US. So far, two patients have been dosed. The company has not disclosed additional details on the outcome of the study. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention, and I am happy to try to answer any questions. Great. Thanks so much, Dr. Shapiro. I'm going to ask um, Dr. Corzo to come on, maybe, and um, Dr. Valentino is there as well, too, to help out. But we do have a couple of questions that have come in. I'll start with the first one. Um, why are immunodeficient NSG mice used for the um, preclinical studies? Wouldn't it be expected that these animals would not develop fibrosis? Okay, I, I can answer the beginning part of that, Daya, and then you can um, talk further about it. The NSG mice is a brand of immunodeficient laboratory mice, and they uh, are deficient in T and B cells and natural killer cells. This was done to limit the mouse response to human factor VIII not the issue related to pericapsular fibrosis, which is more of a local reaction. But Dea, you could speak to that in more detail. Thank you, Dr. Shapiro. Um, so we have, in fact, uh, evaluated the 6001 product in different strains and different models of rodents as well as in non-human primates, specifically why an immunosuppressed um, mouse like NSG are used. It has to be with the fact that we are testing human cells producing human protein. So this xenogenic environment uh, will not fully abrogate Actually, it will induce uh, fibrosis because of the xenogenic nature of the experiment. While the product is intended to be used in an allogeneic setting, meaning these are human cells to be given to human pa patients to produce a human protein with uh, the, uh, the human glycosylation and post-translation and modifications of those proteins. So the NSGs are used so that we can do two things. Uh, check the long-term safety uh, while the capsules are producing the, uh, the, the protein. Uh, something that we cannot do with an immunocompetent model like hemophilia A mice. 
Wonderful. Great. Um, I will go to the next question. Let me pull it up. It comes in. Um, what are the risks of the laparoscopic procedure to implant the spheres? Uh, I think the risks of the laparoscopic procedure are likely no more than a risk of a laparoscopic procedure that's performed in a patient for clinical criteria. Uh, for many reasons, our patients undergo these procedures in a clinical setting for either surgical removal of, um, uh, for example, an appendix or for biopsies or other reasons. In this case, uh, the administration of the spheres is done via this procedure, and the spheres themselves uh, don't create a problem for the patient, it appears at this time, and in the preclinical settings that has held up as well in non-human primates as shown on the prior slides. Dr. Corzo, would you like to add anything to that? No, Amy, that's a full response, thank you. I have a question that came in. Um, for patients on the call, how might you describe how cell therapy is different than the uh, than gene therapy or other innovative therapies in trials for hemophilia now to a patient sitting in your office? I think um, there are some very um, important differences based for this therapy as compared to uh, some of the gene therapy platforms that we have at this time. For example, this is a, a therapy that does not provide a vector, a viral vector that's exposing the patient to, for example, AAV. Uh, you don't have to worry about endogenous antibody levels in terms of a patient's eligibility for such a a vector and you don't have to worry about liver inflammation uh, or rejection of the vector if the liver inflammation, for example, is missed and then the um, transgene is extinguished by the immune response. Uh, this is also a modular therapy. So for example, over time, um, it could be readministered to the patient without concern about immune reaction. Uh, it is also, you could dose up in individuals. Theoretically, you could remove the uh, alginate spheres if needed for a particular reason. Uh, so I think it's really quite a novel approach and quite a different concept than current gene-based therapies uh, that we have available right now for in clinical studies. Daya, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, if I may, is uh, the the um, this approach uh, avoids the integration of any DNA into the host into the patient cells, which is a, um, it's a Big, very clear difference from gene therapy approaches. Right. Thank you for adding that. Right. Uh, another question that came in, um, are HIV hepatitis C patients included or excluded from the trials? Um, they are not excluded from the trial. Uh, however, at this point in time, since this is a phase one, two trial, we are uh, looking at uh, the liver function that patients have and the abdominal cavity in a sense. Uh, somebody who has end stage uh, or closer to end stage liver disease or ascites would not be eligible. Uh, we are looking for people with normal CBCs essentially and prothrombin times that are uh, within a near normal range. So again, you know, in early phase studies, you tend to pick a population that uh, can provide um, a clearer picture of how that therapy may work in the longer term. But again, HIV or hep C patients, if it's well controlled or the hep C is treated are not excluded from the trial. 
Wonderful. Another question that came in. Um, how long do you expect that these cells will continue to function and produce factor eight in the body? Is this it's a lifelong treatment? Well, that's a very good question. Um, there is not um, a decade or two decades worth of data. The cells are quite long lived and actually can divide within the spheres and replace a neighbor cell if a cell dies. Um, so we do expect that this is a longer term therapy. Uh, how long it lasts is not clearly defined at this point, but again, redosing is possible. Uh, Dr. Corzo, would you like to add anything about expectations? Yes, the, uh, we expect the therapy to be long lasting, multi-year, and it was designed to be long lasting because the spheres themselves are placed in the peritoneum where nutrients and oxygen can nourish the cells. The spheres are porous to allow for that nourishment to come in. The spheres are made with antifibrotic component to prevent the uh, foreign uh, body reaction to biomaterials. And the cells themselves, as Dr. Shapiro mentioned, can proliferate. Um, and exhibit control proliferation as contact inhibition. Um, the, the technology itself, as Dr. Shapiro said, is not decades long of duration, but it has been tested by the MIT group who originally developed it for up to the end of the experiments that they run, which was uh, over a year in diabetic mice and several months in, mon in monkeys. And we, during the development of this technology for hemophilia have also tested up to studies that have lasted up to six months in rodents and one, one year in non-human primates. One thing I would just like to add to what uh, Dr. Corzo has uh, said is that these, this cell line is not a malignant cell line. So patients don't have to worry that these cells have uncontrolled proliferation. It is, um, a human cell line that has only controlled growth within the spheres as needed. Great, Great. Um, questions keep rolling in here. The next one is <laughs> if a patient has done gene transfer resulting with less than ideal factor levels, can this patient still do cell therapy in the future? Um, at this point in time for the studies that patient would not be eligible. However, um, should these studies uh, prove that this platform uh, should progress to further studies. And for example, if it were licensed sometime in the future, yes, those patients, uh, I would think from a clinical standpoint would be eligible. Wonderful. Um, next question came, has come in. Um, is this technology applicable to other bleeding disorders, including rare factor deficiencies in von Willebrand's disease? Well, that's a great question. And I think it's something the company is exploring. Uh, I think this study or these studies will show proof of concept um, in the human. Uh, so I believe that those studies are really critical to further work that the company does. But Dr. Corzo, can you address it from uh, the company's standpoint? Certainly, we believe that it could be applicable to other rare blood disorders, particularly those disorders in which the half-life of the protein is so short that it requires very frequent administration of, of the factors. And we are exploring some, um, some of those indications uh, very carefully. One of the limitations, a few limitations of the theoretically the platform has is that there is certain size of proteins that could come out of the spheres. Um, uh, so very large molecules, for example, the entire von Willebrand factor will not, is too large to get out of the, of the spheres and that will not be a, a, an approach that we could use. Um, next question, um, are there other cellular therapies currently in development that you know of? Uh, not that I am aware of at this time. Dr. Corzo, are you aware of any other cellular therapies? 
not in the uh, bleeding disorders, um, but for other indications. So the uh, the history of cell therapies has been closely associated to diabetes type one, yes. having cells that produce insulin. So there are several uh, companies that are trying to develop cell therapies for that indication, but I'm not aware of others working in the blood disorders. Next question, um, what do you think the risk um, for inhibitor development is with this therapy? In my estimation, the risk for development with inhibitor for inhibitors with this therapy would be no different uh, than administration of exogenous factor VIII in these patients. This is a B domain deleted human factor VIII, which has essentially been on the market for long periods of time. Uh, so it has a proven track record and safety. Um, so in, unless there's something intrinsically different in terms of it being taken up by lymphatics and into pu pushed into the blood supply, which we don't believe will be true because factor eight uh, diffuses widely when administered intravenously, uh, the risk would be the same. Um, if question. I could add, in fact, the, the sustained release of factor is something that has been in, in therapy trials proven to be less immunogenic than the frequent bolus administration, which um, it, it, it stimulates the immune system if there is a response to be formed against that protein. So we're not um, evaluating that in the first in human study, the patients eligible or don't have history of inhibitors or current inhibitors, but um, that doesn't deny the fact that the sustained release is probably something that um, in fact could be perhaps in the future tested for patients with inhibitors. Great, great, thank you. Uh, next question that comes in. I understand that the company is also looking at this technology to treat diabetes. Could one treatment be used to treat a hemophilia A patient who also has diabetes? I don't think you could probably use the, the same alginate spheres uh, with a double trans gene. So I think you'd probably need two doses of spheres, but Dr. Corso. That's yes, actually an excellent question. So uh, for diabetes, the cell type is actually different than the approach for any other of the therapeutic areas. And the reason for that is the, the cells need to be able to produce insulin and only beta cells do that. So for the diabetes, we're using um, stem cells that are differentiated to the stage where they can produce insulin. So it's a different, it's the stem cells. And for every other therapeutic area, we are using these human, fully differentiated epithelial cells. So I'm, I'm afraid that the answer is no, uh, they would be different products. Uh, possibly could, could one, one could think that is conceivable to have two different cell types administered to a patient with hemophilia and diabetes. Mm -hmm. Not in the same sphere though, right? That would Probably be a different not. product yeah. you'd have to go to the FDA for. <laughs> Probably not, yeah. Great, next question that comes in. Um, are the modified cells homologous or from an analogous cell line? I, I'm not quite sure what the question is. Daya, do you understand that question? And is it autologous or allogeneic? Allogen Correct. Yes. I'm sorry, that was probably me butchering the, the pronunciation there, I apologize. But can you say it again, Brett? Yeah, I said, are the modified cells homologous or from a patient or from an analogous cell line? Okay, they are not taken from the patient. They are a separate cell line, a human cell line, which is why they have to be protected. So this is not like a bone marrow transplant or where you harvest the patient cells and put a transgene in and then put them into the spheres. This is a stable cell line 
that has the trans gene for human factor eight B domain deleted that's already put into it. Uh, next question that comes in, um, is there any weight limitation for the treatment? If someone has a big belly and can they still get the treatment even though they have a lot of fat? Well, um, right now uh, we're looking for people who can undergo laparoscopic procedures fairly simply. So someone who was um, and I don't like using these terms, but very obese, morbidly obese would not be a great candidate at this point in time. Um, but in the future, it shouldn't be a problem, but it needs to be placed over the omentum um, and that area be visible to the surgeon. Dr. Corzo, any comments? Yeah, that's, that's correct. For the first in human trials, we the, the, the study has a, a maximum BMI, which is actually uh, very generous to put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, actually patients who have mo um, morbid obesity undergo bariatric procedures that are done laparoscopically. So as we gain more experience, that could be expand, expanded, but as, as, as of this moment, we are, um, we have some limits on the bone in the body mass index. But it's always good to lose weight. Great. Thank you both. A couple more questions here. That's um, just the support lens staying healthy emails. Right. Health and wellness. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> A um, couple more questions that came in. Why use a B domain de um, deleted factor eight gene rather than a full length gene? It has to do with putting it into the cell um, as a trans gene. Uh, Dr. Corzo, can you comment on that? Yeah, it was uh, two reasons. Uh, the main one is that beta domain deleted products have an ample legacy of safety um, in hemophilia. And the second to you know, facilitate the export not the export, the secretion, the diffusion of the protein outside of the sphere. As I said, there is a limit about how big the proteins can be to effectively get out of the spheres. And just to remind people of uh, the cellular production of the B domain deleted protein as compared to the full length protein is enhanced. Great. Uh, next question is, when uh, can we expect to hear more about the results? I suppose when we have them. <laughs> I'm glad. Okay, yeah. Uh, yes, I, I think um, you know, we have publicly said that the first two patients have been dosed in the last quarter of uh, at the end of last year. And we prefer to have more patients and longer follow up before you know, presenting the, the data in any of the scientific forums, including forums like this. Great. Um, what are the factor levels for a situation that is deemed successful? Oh, that's a good question. I think at this point in time, uh, what we're targeting are levels within the mild range. Um, as a proof of concept based upon the volume of the beads that are being administered. Uh, I think the advantage to this therapy is that uh, it could be uh, re-administered or a higher dose administered based upon a desired target level for a particular patient. Great. And one more question, we'll let, uh, let the panel off the hook here. Um, if everything goes well, when might patients expect to be able to um, uh, receive the treatment? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> I wish it were sooner than later. Um, doing these studies is not easy. It's a laborious process. You have to uh, go slowly um, and you have to look at safety. Safety, as you remember, is the primary outcome here. So you have to look at each patient's data very carefully before proceeding. 
uh, to either the next patient or the next dose level. Uh, once this study is completed, further studies will be required um, after a phase one, two to widen the patient population that's been treated and look at uh, efficacy and safety over a longer period of time. So it's a bit of time. Uh, it's always hard for me to estimate these things, but I would say a number of years. Uh, Dr. Corzo, do you have an estimate or? Uh, no, I, I'm, I'm afraid the, the, the better answer is, you know, when a successful phase three is completed, that's the time where you will file with sufficient efficacy and safety information to that fully characterize the product in this setting. We hope that once we know the dose that is associated to certain factor level from phase one, two studies, then that we will confirm that signal and the safety profile in a phase three study. But I prefer at this time not to give specific, um, more specifics on time than that. But they have moved very quickly for this phase one, two trial. That's optimistic. I'm always an optimist. <laughs> Great. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Corzo, and, and Dr. Valentino as well um, for taking the time to join us this afternoon. Uh, we appreciate uh, your time and expertise. And I'd also like to thank each and every one of you for joining us. Um, please note that this recorded webinar will be available on Friday, March 5th at he hemophilia.org under the events tab with all of our other archived webinars. Also available in the events tab is our upcoming schedule for our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Um, Dr. Shapiro, Dr. Corzo, Dr. Valentino, thank you once again for joining us and um, everyone have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much for having us. Thank you, thank you. Thank you Lynn.